Welcome back to Mindset Rx. I'm your host, Dr. Robin McKay, and this is your place to be if you're an emotionally intelligent leader who's ready to set the tone for a positive, productive, and purposeful day, week, month, year, life, legacy, all the things that you know I always talk about. And I'm so happy to be here with you today at a different time. I'm thinking about moving it permanently to midday or later in the afternoon. It just seems to work better with people's schedules who are coming to the live event on LinkedIn. Of course, if you're listening to this on our sister podcast, Mindset Rx, or on YouTube, it doesn't make such a difference. But for those of you who are joining me live, I'm happy that you're here. And please feel free to say hello and let me know where you are living in the world right now, what's going on with you. Today is a topic that has been coming up a lot privately when I've been talking with people, executives and leaders who are trying to figure something out. So I thought I would bring this to our conversation today. So the topic is how to know when it's time to hire an executive coach. Because nobody ever talks about that. I think that that's something that we kind of still do, if not in secret, at least kind of behind the scenes. I like to think that executive coaching in particular is becoming far more mainstream than it used to be. And it is, there's a recognition among people who engage executive coaches like myself that they do so not because there's anything wrong with them. Certainly they wouldn't and couldn't have accomplished all that they have in their careers if there was something wrong with them. I mean, other than just the human condition, there's something wrong with all of us, I guess, in that way. But there's nothing appreciably problematic to them necessarily. But they've come to recognize the value of having an objective presence, an observer, a somebody that they can lean into as they process through their own challenges and leadership. Because certainly, especially at this time in the world, there are plenty of challenges in the leadership space. In fact, one of my colleagues has been saying recently, and I have to agree with her, that there's a deficit in leadership right now, particularly among emotionally intelligent leaders. I think that we're still, as a group, still, I'm going to use this word, and it'll probably spark something, I hope, but I think that we're still lagging in terms of what we're actually meant to be doing here on planet Earth at this time in the world. So in part, this topic that I'm going to talk about today, how do you know when it's time to hire an executive coach, has to do with understanding who you need to be in order to prepare yourself to work with an executive coach and how we need to shift mindset away from the answering the question of what's wrong with me or trying to fix what's wrong with me, rather to start focusing on what's right with you and what's making what's right more right to help you align with your actualized self. That's kind of the purpose I think of executive coaching is refinement to recognize that great athletes have coaches. Great athletes have psychological coaches, people who pay attention to their mindset, help them refine what's right and make what's right more right. And that too is the case for executive coaches. So let me take you through some of the ways that you can know that it's time to hire an executive coach. And then I have a couple of thoughts for you as well about who's a good candidate for executive coaching. This is something that I think is also really important when we look at the, the relationship between a coach and a leader. So I made a list. I love lists. So how do you know when it's time to hire an executive coach? Well, some of these are no brainers. Hire one, hopefully before you're burned out, or if you feel like you're headed for burnout. Burnout is a really interesting word that gets kicked around a lot these days. And what the research shows is that there are three major components to burnout. One is the, the physiological or the physical burnout. Like I'm fatigued. I'm having a hard time getting out of bed. It may even present like anxiety or depression even. A second aspect of burnout has to do with your relationship with other people. And that comes in the form of compassion fatigue, feeling disconnected from other people, feeling cynical about other people, feeling frustrated by other people and their decisions or their choices. 
So compassion fatigue is another piece of burnout. And then the third piece that goes often unnoticed for a longer period of time is when you look at your career path and you've been on a straight up everything that you touch turns to gold and you just keep going higher and higher and you keep getting promotions, you keep getting recognition, awards, and then all of a sudden you plateau. And whatever is next for you feels out of reach. Whatever is next for you feels like there's no way I can accomplish it. Even though everything that you've ever set out to do, you've accomplished this next level thing feels like it's not going to happen for you. So those are the three, the three aspects that, that contribute to burnout. But that overarching umbrella of burnout is a real good signal that it's time to hire an executive coach, particularly one who's well-versed in burnout recovery, right? So Obviously, you're not going to hire a resume coach if you're feeling burned out. You want to find somebody who's really well-versed in burnout recovery. Another way that you can tell you're ready for an executive coach is if you're in the middle of an existential conundrum. I don't actually think that it rises to the level of existential crisis for most people. But what I've seen in the last few years, especially with the executives who I work with, they're looking around the world, they're looking around their jobs, they're looking around their companies and they're saying, is this all there is? What's my purpose? They're asking deep questions that maybe they weren't asking before 2020. Maybe they were just on the straight up trajectory of lockstep with everybody else in terms of what's next and what's next and what's next. And then 2020 happened and the pandemic and all of the social and political unrest and trauma that we've experienced over the past few years, both individually and collectively. And they keep, there's something that's gnawing. This is almost a soul level gnawing that I know that I'm meant to do something more than this. I know that I'm meant for more than this, or I was born for such a time as this. What am I supposed to be doing? How am I supposed to be contributing? Those are all existential questions that if you are asking them, they're worthy of being answered. And to be done so in the, in the frame of an executive coach alliance really helps you to not just answer the question, but then live out the answer to those existential questions. So another way that you can know that you're meant to work with an executive coach is that you've accomplished all of your career goals. Everything that you set out to do when you were 23, fresh out of undergrad or 28, fresh out of professional school, wherever you were when you first started out, everything that you set out to do, you've accomplished. You thought it was going to take your entire career to do, but your long-term, you know, whatever, 20-year plan turned into a 15-year plan or turned into a 10-year plan. So you're at a place in your career where you've accomplished everything you set out to and you don't know what's next. Where do you apply your gifts, talents, and abilities next? And if you can't answer that or you want to find out the answer to that, an executive coach is a good place to start in answering that question. I've talked about this next one before, but it bears repeating because this is something that I'm seeing more and more as executives show up into my, into my private coaching practice, and that is corporate trauma. I often say that corporate, tra corporate trauma doesn't necessarily rise to the level of a clinical diagnosis, but certainly over the course of a person's career, they're going to have experiences with sexism, with racism, with all the isms. They're going to have individual conflict. They're going to have experiences where they feel shut down where they feel thwarted, where they feel overlooked, where they feel attacked, where they feel threatened. And those experiences are then held in the physical body, held in the imagination. And when it comes time to figure out what's next, one of the major barriers or gaps to that next level thing that you're looking for, the next position, the next promotion, the next contribution, 
is the, the body's response, the body, mind, and spirit's response to the traumas that you experienced earlier in your life. So unless and until you're able to clear those traumas, to make peace with those traumas, to heal those traumas, that next level is going to feel elusive to you. Now, you might still be able to accomplish the next level. Certainly, there's, there's no accounting for an individual's force of will. But to do so joyfully, to do so gratefully, to do so with optimism and hope and flow requires a different energy than one that's mostly captivated by trauma. So if you've got corporate trauma, it's time to work with an executive coach. Again, somebody who's specifically trained and well-versed in managing and resolving trauma. Right? It doesn't have to be a therapist necessarily. Certainly, I'm not a therapist. But I do have a background in clinical work. I do have a PhD in psychology, and I'm very well adept at addressing those micro traumas that have accumulated behind your heart. And by the way, as any good executive coach would do, when I or when another of my colleagues feels like something is outside of the scope of what we're meant to be doing in an executive coaching practice, we have a wonderful referral base of therapists and of people who are, who are, who are positioned to be able to support those bigger traumas that need more attention than what we're able to give in a, an executive coaching practice. So that's just a little bit of education on that differentiation between coaching and therapy. But it is something to keep in mind when you're looking at, is it time to hire an executive coach? Let's see. I've got a whole list of things. And I want to see what else I want to talk about in terms of the time to hire an executive coach. Here's one. There are a couple of here that I want to talk about now. One is that your values no longer align with your company's values. I've had a couple of people during what I, I've called this. There's, there's the great resignation. There's the great, um, I forget what it's called, the great mix up, the great shake up within the organizations, the great reshuffle. But there's also a great awakening that's happened to a lot of people's consciousness, particularly emotionally intelligent people. When, to refer back to what I talked about earlier with the existential conundrums, when you're really in that place of wondering what's next and what your purpose is, the likelihood that your values, what you hold precious and dear, are going to bump up against corporate values is pretty great. Is it enough for you to stay in this in this field that kind of nominal, nominally points to your values? Or is it even more important now than ever before to find an organization or to find a position within the organization that is in alignment with your values? I think that emotionally intelligent leaders would say that the latter is very important. Another way that you know it's time to hire an executive coach is that you know that you can do a lot of things on your own. You know that because you have done so much on your own. Nothing's ever been handed to you. You certainly worked hard. You committed yourself. You put in the time. You made a lot of sacrifices in order to accomplish what you've accomplished. But there's something inside that gnawing, that soul level gnawing that I was talking about earlier that, that creates this knowing for yourself that you're not meant to walk this leg of your journey by yourself. I certainly know that in my career, I remember early on, I think I was still an undergrad. I read about how important it was for young women to have mentors. And I was like, dude, I don't have a mentor, but I really, really wanted a mentor, but I didn't have a mentor. So I just did what I always had done, which was work really hard, stay focused, manage the anxiety that, that I had about performance as best I could. Eventually I graduated, got my job and off I went. And along the way, I certainly did have people who mentored me, but it wasn't until my third year in graduate school that I actually had the experience of a legit mentor in my life. And when she showed up, she said, I will mentor you, but you have to promise me this. You have to promise me that you're not going to 
fall out of sight after you graduate. You have to promise me that you're going to do your work in this world. And I promised her. And here I am all these years later doing my work in the world, just as I promised. And I didn't, I promised her, but I really, it was a promise, a sacred promise to me. So the value of mentors, the value of advisors is something that I think goes unacknowledged or unnoticed. And certainly, you know, early on, I think that when we think about mentoring or advising, we think about kind of a free service that we get provided in undergrad or even in grad school. But we don't think about mentoring or advising as a place where we can actually invest in ourselves and in our futures. Because the truth is about executive coaching is that you are your own best investment. And so sometimes you have to actually invest your financial resources into the executive coaching. I shouldn't say sometimes, like all the time you have to do that, but you have to get really okay with that because you're your own best investment. And that coach, that ally that you're going to bring on to your success team is going to be somebody who is going to prove themselves invaluable as you progress, because you know you're not meant to walk this leg of your journey by yourself. Here are a couple of other things that I would say, if you've got that kind of niggling that you want to hire an executive coach, I would say, if you want to refine your leadership skills, if you're tired of your ideas being co-opted or outright stolen or unacknowledged, if you're tired of that, if you know you've got to learn how to say no and mean it, if you've got too much stuff on your plate and you're worried that something's going to fall off or you're afraid of failing or you're afraid of succeeding, if you're worried about what happens if I actually get what I say I want? What happens if I actually get that executive seat at the table? How much more am I going to have to sacrifice? How much more am I going to have to suffer when I have that seat at the table? If you're worried about things like that, that's a perfect time to hire an executive coach to move you out of that suffering and sacrifice syndrome. You're, you're welcome for the alliteration, but to move you out of that suffering and sacrifice syndrome and move you into the creator, the contribution, the coaching, the and better experience of being a leader. That's going to be a real important time to hire an executive coach. And the last thing I'll say is this. There are some people who come to me after having received their promotion or they've spent some time in their new role as a top leader in their organization. They're getting some feedback that maybe things aren't going as well as they ought to be. Maybe they're having some com communication problems. Maybe there's not an executive presence that's as strong as it needs to be. So people will come to me and say, can you work with me on this? And yes, that is in my wheelhouse to do so. But here's the thing that I want you to know about if you're a good candidate for executive coaching, because that's two. there's two different things, right? There's one is, do I hire an executive coach? And the next one is, who do I hire? And how do I even know if I'm a good, good candidate for that person? And of course, I can only speak from my perspective. So you're going to get my perspective. And if you ask, you know, another dozen ex executive coaches, you might get some similarities in the responses to what I'm about to share. But good candidates for executive coaching, and this doesn't matter for me, it's anybody from director level up is who I'm really adept at working with and who really needs to work with somebody like me. Individual contributors often don't need to work with me yet. They're not in a place of doing that, although there are some high performing individual contributors who have a lot of leadership potential who find their way to me as well. But a good candidate for executive coaching is somebody who's willing to be coachable, who's not just going to say yes and do nothing, who's going to take action on whatever ideas, whatever recommendations, whatever advising comes forward in, in their sessions. But also, I think that's a piece of the puzzle. But another piece of the puzzle that I think is really important and goes over, overlooked is the requirement to be willing to do the inner work. When I talk about corporate trauma, that means that there's something in there that needs to come forward. 
There's a story that needs to be told. There's a perspective that needs to shift. You have to be willing to get, I'm going to use the word vulnerable and it's not exactly right, but to get transparent maybe is a better way of saying that with what's going on inside of you. See, this is one of the major challenges for executives who come into an executive coaching alliance is that they're so guarded. They've guarded their hearts. They've guarded their thinking for so long because they've had to, because they haven't felt safe to be able to expose what's actually going on behind the scenes. They keep that to themselves. They keep it private because they've been trained and dare I say indoctrinated into the, into believing that you should never let them see you sweat. You should never let them see you cry. And especially for women, you can never be your whole feminine self, which is listen, people. It's a bald faced lie. And yet it is one that gets propagated over and over and over again, particularly in fields that I work in with tech and fintech and healthcare, where there is still a disparity in the, in the gender differences, especially at the highest levels of leadership. There's also a belief that for women in particular, that we have to relinquish our femininity. We have to, my mentor, Barb, who I wrote Smart Girls in the 21st Century with has said this for years. She said, women don't need remedial masculinity lessons. And yet still into this day, we're being trained and I'm gonna say socialized to mute our emotions, to look more like or be more like a stereotypical male. I have to I have to say something that just just cracked me up. My computer somehow that that um, automated responder on my system just picked up on the word stereotypical male and gave me a definition for that. That's funny. Um, so we really want to come back into that space of real true leadership, whether you identify as male or female, no matter how masculine or feminine you actually feel in the moment, I think the most important thing is that you come into alignment with who you are really at your core. And that requires some deep sea fishing in, in your soul. It requires a soul level transformation. There are some people who aren't willing to do that and that's okay. They're just in my practice, they're not great candidates to work with me because I can, I can understand your intellect and I can work with your emotions, but I really can't help you transform unless and until I know the contents of your soul. And it's not like you have to treat executive coaching like a confessional. That's not what I'm talking about. But to have that willingness to seek what's inside of you, to be able to shift things and look at things in a different perspective, this is, it's a requirement for having a productive executive coaching alliance. And I think that I'm just seeing if there's anything else I want to say about that, because there are so many other kind of nuances to who's a good candidate for executive coaching. Being emotionally intelligent is one of those. Being a go-getter is one. Being somebody who is a quick decision maker and who doesn't go back on their decisions, who doesn't waffle on their decisions. This is a very important one as well. Um, that's how, and that's how coaching I think is different from therapy. Therapy is a much more, um, you know, meet people where they're at and move them in the direction of well-being. But in coaching, especially in the executive coaching Alliance, people are doing pretty well already and they might have some stuff going on behind the scenes that's sort of influencing or interfering with their next level, but it's not to the degree that it's necessarily impairing them in any way. And so when you're working toward not just average development, but optimal development or actualization, that's when we can get into just that refinement of your leadership, refinement of your personality, refinement of your vision, refinement of your purpose, really getting you in contact with what you're meant to be doing here and now in this world at this time. 
Because the ones who do really, really well in executive coaching are the ones who know that they're born for this time and that there is something more out there for them that they're meant to be doing, that they're meant to be contributing, even though they've accomplished so much on their own. And that's the, that's sort of the paradox of potential, isn't it? It's like, I've accomplished so much. I have so much. And there are some people who don't have very much. And so I should feel guilty or I feel bad or I feel embarrassed or ashamed that I want even more. And yet, let me just reassure you here that the resolution of the potential paradox is quite simply leaning into your potential. You help more people by leaning into your potential than you do by withdrawing from your potential. Isn't that a relief? It is to me. When I know that I can benefit more people by leaning into my work, by leaning into my purpose, than I could by sitting on the couch and watching Netflix and eating bonbons. Now, I do that a fair share too, don't get me wrong. But I always know that I'm meant to be leaning in. I always know that I'm meant to be here influencing. And maybe you do too. But the tension we feel is that, especially when we haven't done the inner work yet or we're in progress on inner work, we're still kind of being led around by the old stories that other people have told us by generational and genetic and cultural and societal influences that tell us how we're supposed to be. And when you clear all of those through the executive coaching process, you actually can just stand in who you are as a person and know without apology what you're meant to be doing in the world and go do that. All right. So I feel like this has been a good a good conversation. I've loved being here. And I, I know I just had a conversation with myself, but I, (laughs) I hope you enjoyed listening because I sure enjoyed talking about this and, and kind of clarifying like what, when is the right time? And I want to say this last thing about that, the timing for executive coaching. First of all, I don't believe that there's a right timing or a wrong timing. I'm the creator of my experiences, just as you're the creator of your experiences. And you get to decide as creator, when's the right time. So to that point, then, when you decide it's the right time for executive coaching, and you go to your supervisor, your boss, and you say, hey, I want to hire an executive coach, and they say no. Like, I want you to think about what that does to your sense of potential to your sense of authority, your sense of sacred autonomy. And this is why one of the things I always say is that the leaders who work with me often invest their own funds in their coaching rather than relying on their employers to pay for their coaching. Because for that very reason, if you go to your coach and the, or you go to your boss and you say, hey, I want to do this coaching and they say no, but here's some other tasks like to keep you busy instead, let me reward you with more work. What message does that send you? So when you take your coaching into your own corner and you say, I'm doing this for me, I'm investing in me. A lot of my clients find that their organizations will reimburse them, but it's not in their decision-making process in terms of actually hiring me or anybody else. They're just willing to invest in themselves in order to be able to make the shifts and the changes that they want to make because they believe in their potential as well. So that's my two cents today. And I really have enjoyed being here with you. If you found this information useful, share it. Share it with your network. I love that. I appreciate it. It makes my day. And uh, if you want to talk to me about possibly coaching together, you can send me an email at robin, R-O-B-Y-N, at drrobinmckay.com. And let me know that you would like to start the process of having a conversation about that. We've got some steps to go. There's an application process for that. But I think that it's always the best time to start coaching. The best time to start coaching is when you say, I really ought to start coaching. That's always a really good signal from your inner self that it's time to go. All right. Big love. I will see you all next week. And In the meantime, have a wonderful day and, you know, take good care of yourself and really start listening to your inner self, to your intuition on things like transformation. This is going to be your superpower now and in the future. 
See you later.